السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ قال موسى لقومه اذكروا نعمة الله عليكم إذ أنجاكم من آل فرعون يسومونكم سوء العذاب ويذبحون أبناءكم ويستحيون ويستحيون نساءكم وفي ذلك بلاء من ربكم عظيم وإذ تأذن ربكم لئن شكرتم لأزيدنكم ولئن كفرتم إن عذابي لشديد وقال موسى إن تكفروا أنتم ومن في الأرض جميعا فإن الله لغني حميد الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين ثم أما بعد وانسجان السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته I'm, uh, I'd like to first express how honored I feel and how grateful I am for having this opportunity with you. And I ask Allah Azza wa Jal that He gives me clarity of speech tonight as I address you briefly um, and also not allow my jet lag uh, to get in the way of being clear in my speech, inshallah ta'ala. Also my Americanness. So there are two obstacles before me as I speak to you. <laughs> but anyhow, um, the topic I was given uh, was to never lose hope in the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. And what I personally, just as an introduction to this topic, what I like to do when I talk about subjects that I'm offered, that I'm handed, I don't think of all the ayat or ahadith that I can think of that have to do with that topic and sort of lay out a speech in my head. That's not the methodology I personally take. I personally take the methodology of, well, in this matter, this concern, which is a legitimate concern, not losing hope in Allah's mercy, what are some places in the Qur'an that Allah deals with this and helps the Sahaba, the companions of the Prophet the first students of the Qur'an, how does he help them deal with this on numerous occasions, and at least pick one of those places and pay attention to it. Because a lot of times we hear a lot of ayat and a lot of a hadith, and we, we hear so much text, if you will, so much delil, so much evidence, and we pass through all of them so quickly, that we don't actually get to stop and pay attention to any one of them in depth. Or really appreciate what Allah is saying at one place, because each one of those things is a treasure. So that's what I'm going to try to do for you folks. And so in order to lay the foundation for this talk, I want to tell you that my entire conversation with you revolves around Surah Ibrahim. Surah Ibrahim is the 14th Surah of the Qur'an. And it belongs to a group of Surahs in the Qur'an that are all Makki. They're all early before the Prophet ﷺ migrated. But they are later in the Meccan era. They're not early Meccan, they're later Meccan Surahs. What that means is by this point, the Prophet's mission وسلم, has become extremely difficult. The, the people who disbelieve aren't just rejecting Islam, they're also insulting it. They're also physically beginning to physically attack Sahaba. They're beginning to physically attack the Prophet وسلم. Unjustified murder has already taken place of a few Muslims. It's already happened. The Muslims are already being mentally prepared that this may not be a place where they will be able to survive and Allah Azza wa Jal will soon open the doors to Medina. But before that, the difficult challenge of Ta'if will come. So we're in that season, in the seerah of the Prophet Wasallam, that a number of surahs came down, the purpose of which was to help the Muslims deal with difficult times. These are very difficult times for the companions. These are difficult times for the Prophet ﷺ. And Allah Himself reveals therapy. Allah reveals the counsel. How should they mentally prepare themselves, spiritually prepare themselves, psychologically prepare themselves for you know, th these difficult times, inshaAllah ta'ala. So that's the, that's the context of this surah. Assalamu alaikum. Okay, folks. So I'm by profession, I'm going to take a tangent here and tell you something. By profession, I'm a teacher. That's what I do for a living, I teach. And teaching and speaking are two very different things. Okay, so speaking is what comes to me as a secondary thing, really primarily I'm a teacher. And a teacher is more concerned with the student's attention span than anything else. I'm extremely concerned with attention span. You know what that means? I'm constantly paying attention to where you're looking. 
Do you see what I'm, those of you that have that guilty smile on your face already know what I'm talking about. Okay? So what happens in large crowds, whether it's a dars, it's a khutbah, it's a PhD level like chemistry class or whatever, if you're sitting in a class and something moves, a thousand eyes look that way. Wow! I've never seen that before. <laughs> it could be something as simple as a bulb flickering or somebody walking by, but all eyes turn that way. So try to fight the temptation. I know it's going to be difficult for you, but try to fight the temptation and try to pay as much attention as you can. I promise I won't make this speech very long. I'll try to keep it as concise and organized as possible. But just to see, because I'm a teacher, just to see if you remember, what, what chapter of hadith am I talking about today? Uh, what chapter of hadith from Bukhari? Huh? Who remembers? Huh? No, you don't remember? Anybody? Anybody? Yeah. Surah Ibrahim? From the Quran. Yes, very good. So those of you who mentioned the chapter from Bukhari, shame on you. Very good. Alright. So Surah Ibrahim. And the situation of the Muslims, this is extremely loud now, very good. The, the situation of the Muslims has gotten very, very difficult. And Allah reveals basically a sermon to the Muslims on how to deal with this problem. How to deal with it. And it begins, Surah Ibrahim begins with reminding the Messenger وسلم, and the Muslims, why, why are they in this trouble to begin with? Why even bother with all these difficulties? So the very first ayah Allah Azza wa reveals to His Messenger وسلم, saying, Alif Lam Ra Kitabun Anzalnahu ilayk لِتُخْرِجَ النَّاسِ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ لَا النُّورِ A magnificent book that we've sent down to you so that you can extract people, pull people out of darknesses into light. That's your mission. But you don't get to pull anybody out of the light. بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ He qualifies it by Allah's permission, by the, by the permission of their master. Meaning the Messenger's job وسلم, is to deliver this revelation so people can come out of the darknesses of ignorance and worshipping their own temptations and living a life of heedlessness to come into the light of guidance. And if you have to go through trouble for this mission, well it's worth it. That's, that's the mission that you've been handed. لِتُخْرِجَ النَّاسِ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ بِإِذْنِ رَبِّهِمْ إِلَى صِرَاتِ الْعَزِيزِ الْحَمِيدِ Very powerful beginning. And now, as the surah transitions, I'm not going to talk to you about the entire surah, but just give you some idea. As the surah transitions, one of the first case studies that we, we learn about is the study of Musa alayhi salam. And when Allah describes Musa alayhi salam in the very first passage of the surah, listen carefully now, خَاصَةً مِنْكُمْ الَّذِينَ يَفْهَمُونَ العربية, يَقُولُ وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا مُوسَى بِآيَاتِنَا أَنْ أَخْرِجْ قَوْمَكَ مِنَ الظُّلُمَاتِ إِلَى النُّورِ That's the kalam. He says, we sent Musa with our miraculous signs, instructing him with the same thing, pull people out of the various shades of darkness into light. Pull people out of darknesses into light. Allah just said that in the beginning to Muhammad Rasulullah صلى الله عليه وسلم. Few ayat later, he's telling him, this is what I told Musa also. Exactly what I told Musa alayhi salam. Why is Allah telling him that? Because now you're supposed to read about or learn about Musa alayhi salam, but you won't actually be learning about Musa alayhi salam. You will be learning a case study so you know what to do. So the stories of the Prophet alayhi salatu salam, especially when they're mentioned in a context like this, they are there to prepare the Sahaba. They're not just for them to learn history. Musa alayhi salam is not going to be talked about in this surah just so we learn some history. He's going to be talked about so that the sahaba learn how do you deal with problems? How do you deal with a difficult situation? How do you deal with it? And so their khatib, their imam, the imam of Bani Israel is Musa alayhi salam. And Allah now begins to talk about a khutbah that Musa alayhi salam gave to his people. And the summary of that sermon, that khutbah that he gave them is as follows. وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِقَوْمِهِ اذْكُرُوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ عَلَيْكُمْ When Musa said to his, his people, his nation, make mention of Allah's favor unto you. And I'd like you to keep in mind the main points of his khutbah. The first point was, make mention of the favor of Allah unto you. إِذْ أَنْجَاكُمْ مِنْ آلِ فِرْعَوْنِ When he rescued you from the, from the clutches, from the people of Fir'aun, the lineage of descendants of Fir'aun, يَسُومُونَكُمْ سُوءَ الْعَذَابِ They were humiliating you with the worst possible forms of punishment. وَيُذَبِّحُونَ أَبْنَاءَكُمْ And they were slaughtering your children. Now please pay attention here. Musa alayhi salam is the leader, the prophet, sent by Allah to Bani Israel. These people lived in Egypt. These people lived as slaves. And when they lived as slaves, there was a governmental policy to kill babies, maybe boys, every other year. To engage in mass slaughter. Now I'm a parent. I'm a father of six children. 
if even one of my children is close to harm, if I'm coming home, I'm driving my car, I'm about to park the car and the children are playing, I'll park across the street. I don't want to park too close to them, the car might touch them. Even if they're 10 feet away, I'll be extra careful. It's a parent's natural instinct to want to protect their children, isn't it? It's a natural instinct. You don't have to be a Muslim to do that. You don't have to be a Muslim. It's, it's embedded inside of us. And one of the worst, most difficult calamities, the most traumatic experience you can ever experience in life is the loss of a child. The loss of a child is difficult when they're older, when they're young, but it's especially difficult when they're young, when they're babies, when they're small, when they, when they don't fight back, when they don't argue, when they listen to everything you say, when they're always smiling, when looking at them makes you happy and doesn't remind you of their scores and their exams and doesn't remind you of their disappointing, you know, <laughs> behavior. It it just, everything about the child is done at that point. And these new, and especially when a baby is a newborn, just newborn babies, they're only a source of joy. That's all they are, you know. And these babies are being killed by the hundreds of thousands. It's an unimaginable kind of trauma. You know, I come from the United States where you must have heard recently in Connecticut there was a shooting of some innocent children. The entire nation is shaken. The president can't get through a speech without crying. It's not just a Muslim thing, it's a human thing. It's hard to fathom. Can you imagine how traumatic it is to know that hundreds of thousands of children are being slaughtered by a governmental policy? This is what the Bani Israel faced for years after year. Year after year they faced this. Year after year. And now they finally crossed the water. But even though they've crossed the water and they've escaped Fir'aun, does that mean that the scar of having your children slaughtered? How many parents were there whose children had been slaughtered already? Can you imagine how many thousands of parents were there that migrated out of Egypt who remember their baby, baby's face? Who remember that horrible day when their children were murdered in front of their eyes? What is, I mean, it's unimaginable, this stuff. And these, so these people are emotionally scarred. These are the kinds of things people can't get over for years and years. Their entire life they can't get over it. I mean, we know for a fact, for example, the case of, uh, you know, Yaqub alayhi salam. And when he can, he doesn't even know what happened to Yusuf alayhi salam. But does he get over it immediately? No. He is in constant sadness for years and years and years. You know, he, he doesn't get over Yusuf alayhi salam. It's not something you get over easily. But understand at the same time the khutbah that Musa alayhi salam is giving to these people. It began, Uzkuru ni'mat Allahi alaykum. Make mention of Allah's favor upon you. Even if, if this khutbah just stopped right there. He's talking to a bunch of people that have gone through some pretty terrible things. And he's telling them, remember the great favor of Allah on you. Some of them sitting there thinking, uh, all I can remember is problems. What do you mean favor? I don't remember a favor of Allah on me. You know, we're stuck in the middle of the desert, now we're about to starve to death. It's pretty hot out here. And before even then we were living as slaves, our children were murdered, or the women were allowed to live. We were living humiliating lives. What favor of Allah? What are you talking about? But Musa alayhi salam is changing their perception. What is he changing? In all of, and I'll stop here for a second and talk to you and me. I, I, this is not about Musa alayhi salam. You understand? When, they, when the, the Sahaba were listening to this, they weren't just learning history. They were learning about themselves. Every one of you, and, and myself included, there are no exceptions. All of us have problems. At a person, I'm talking at a personal level. We'll talk about the level of the Ummah in a bit. At a personal level, all of us have problems. You may have problems with your parents. May you, have, you may have problems with your brother or your sister. Your hus the husband or the wife, they don't get along. They're constantly arguing. You may have problems with your children. You, have, you may have a problem with your employer. Or you can't find a job. Or you have problems with your friends. You know, you have all kinds of problems, financial problems, career problems, family problems, psychological problems, depression, you have an anger problem, you, get your, you have a laziness problem, all of you, and there's no exception, myself included, we all have problems. And, by, you know, and, and the first thing to admit to ourselves is that in fact, yes, we do have problems in life. This world is going to be a life of problems, this is not Jannah, it's going to have problems. If the greatest of people, alayhi salatu wasalam, were not spared from problems, we're not going to be spared, you know? Now, the fact that we have problems as, at the level of a human being, keep Islam aside for a second, all human beings, you know what they do? They spend most of their life worrying about their problems. 
You're driving your car and you're thinking, man, the bills. Oh my God, how could she say that to me? I can't believe that she did that. And the wife is thinking, why doesn't he ever appreciate me? Why does he never even, you know, I even, I made his specials, his favorite meal the other day and he didn't even acknowledge it. All he could talk about is his mother. Oh God, I can't stand that woman. You know? And the mother's thinking, my son forgot about me ever since he got married. He never even calls me. Even if he calls me, it's so brief. He doesn't care about me anymore. That girl, ugh, she stole my son, you know. Everybody's constantly thinking about their problems. Constantly. It's on their mind. Young guy over here, you, some of you young, sorry, not guy, chaps. Young chaps over here, you know, you're just, man, I gotta get married. How come my parents don't understand that I need to get married? Right? Can't get married. I need, I need to, I'm going to university, there's so much fitna, but my parents just don't understand. Man, I got problems. You know, everybody's thinking about their problems. And Allah Azza wa Jal says, oh, well, by the way, our problems, as bad as they may be, and I'm not undermining your problems, some of you have very serious problems. Sometimes people email me with their problems, and I'm not qualified to deal with their problems. And I try to point them to counselors or other professionals that can help. But yes, you may have serious problems, but I don't know if we got a babies getting slaughtered type problem. I mean, that's a little higher pay grade than our problems. And even they are being told the first thing you need to think about is what? The favors of Allah upon you. The favor, uzkuru ni'matallahi alaykum. Uzkuru ni'matallahi alaykum. Make, make mention, talk about the favor of Allah on you. As many problems as you have, and I have, there's a guarantee. The favors of Allah are so many that we can't even count them. And our problems are limited, always. Our problems, there's a hand, you can count them. I got this problem, this problem, you can make a five, six problem list, ten problem list. Like if I hand the brothers over here a list, say, tell me the problems you have with your wife. And I have, hand the wives a paper and say, tell me the problems you have with your husband. The sisters will probably ask for a notepad instead of a paper. <laughs> but regardless, it's still at the end limited. It's still at the end limited. But the favors of Allah, the good things that are happening for us, Allah's guarantee, first of all, they are beyond human counting. وَإِن تَعُدُّوا نِعْمَةَ اللَّهِ لَا تُحْصُوهَا Same surah, by the way. It occurs in the same surah. If you were to count the favor of Allah, you, couldn't be, you wouldn't be able to encompass it. You wouldn't be able to really grasp it. You don't even appreciate one favor of Allah. If you li- not, don't look at ni'mah as ism jam'ah, you look at it as mufrad. What the meaning is, even one favor of Allah. The favor of Allah, you can't even appreciate that. You have no appreciation what your vision does for you every day. What the ability to inhale and exhale does for you every day. The ability for you to, for you to use both of your legs does every day. I recently met a brother who's got a degenerative disease. Two years ago, he was playing cricket. I know, they even do that in America. So, you know, so he's playing cricket. And he, his disease kicked in, it's a genetic disorder, and now he's lost most of his muscles. One of his arms he can't even lift. The other arm, he only uses three fingers. And he was in a wheelchair, and he could still speak, but he's probably going to lose that soon too, if things go the way they're going. Right? And I talked to him, and I thought he's going to talk to me, you know, Ustaz, can you give me something? Can you remind me of some dua that I can have more sabr? First thing he said is, Ustaz, I think something's wrong with me. I'm actually happy and grateful. I was like, there's nothing wrong with you, bro. I'm jealous. When people go through problems, they stop being grateful. It's a huge gift of Allah that someone can go through trauma like that and still look at the bright side and say, Ya Allah, I'm happy. Whatever you do with me, I'm happy. You know, I'm pleased. That's a great gift from Allah, Azza wa Jal. He was worried that he's sad. I'm like, you should, I'm like, he's not sad. I'm like, that's a gift from Allah, bro. You shouldn't be worried about that. You know? And that brother, all he does all day is recite Quran and do a scar and, you know, all he does, he goes, he tells me, I'm worried I don't do enough zikr. I was like, man, why are you going to make me feel so bad? I'm depressed already. <laughs> where, where do we stand, subhanAllah, you know? And that person's constantly thinking, I have healthy children, I have a job, I have a wife, I have parents that are alive that I can still serve, I have a brother, I have a brother-in-law. He's counting all the things around him that make him happy. And he says, I have all the reasons to be happy, I have no reason to be sad. This, why, why am I telling you this over and over again? Because human beings get stuck on their problem, and it invades their mind, and they can't think after that. All they think about is their problem. And when, you, when all you think about is your problem, you are incapable of being grateful to Allah. Because in order to be grateful to Allah, you have to pay attention to Allah's gifts. 
When is someone grateful? When they receive a gift. If you're not thinking about the gift, then you can't be grateful. Great, being grateful is not just saying Alhamdulillah. It's meaning Alhamdulillah. People are in horrible moods. Hey bro, how's it going? I heard you lost your job. Yeah, Alhamdulillah. That's <laughs> not Alhamdulillah. <laughs> You're complaining and you're saying your complaint word is now Alhamdulillah. Chalo bil khair Alhamdulillah. No, 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 no. You gotta mean it. You have to have that attitude. Now, in the middle of this khutbah, just understand Musa alayhi salam is giving this khutbah to broken hearts. To broken, torn hearts. He's giving them this khutbah. And in the middle of this khutbah comes this probably one of the most remarkable ayat on this subject on having a positive attitude. The subject, topic today is hope. I'm saying where does hope come from? Hope comes from your attitude. It comes from how you think, how you process things, not just what you say. It's not just don't, don't, don't ask the Imam, Sheikh, just give me a zikr, if I do that zikr, my problems will go away. The zikr will be on your tongue until it goes into your heart, your problems won't go away. The problem entity in our bodies is not our tongue. The major problem entity is our hearts. That needs to change. So what offer does Allah Azza wa Jal give? He says, وَإِذْ تَأَذَّنَ رَبُّكُمْ In the middle of this sermon, it's incredible. He says, when your master de- declared, تَأَذَّن تَأَذَّن comes from two origins in the Arabic language. I wish I had more time to discuss linguistics with you. I know it gets a little too technical. But تَأَذَّن comes from izn and azan. It's two words that are, originate in تَأَذَّنَ One word is permission. Allah gave permission. When Allah gave permission and announced something is now the Greek, the gates to something are open. Ta'azzala could also be, Allah made sure you hear it well. The announcement is heard well from Udhan or Adhan is the ears, right? So whatever Allah is about to say, you better listen really carefully. This is not usually, Allah doesn't usually say this. He usually says, is qala rabbukum? With qala rabbukum, when your master said, is ta'azzala rabbukum is very unusual language even for the Qur'an. It's not, the, it's not the norm in the Qur'an for Allah to say, Allah made this proclamation. Allah made sure everybody with open ears listens to this carefully. What is this announcement that everybody should pay extra attention? Even if Allah said, Allah said, is qala rabbukum. If Allah said, is awha ilaykum, is anzala rabbukum. Is allamakum, when He taught you, when He revealed to you, when He sent to you, He didn't use any of those. He used something unique. When Allah declared openly, so everybody might hear. And if I add to that, the less it should enter their hearts. Hopefully it enters their hearts. What is it? The in shakartum. This is what you call in the Arabic language, kalam sharti. Conditional speech. Conditional speech. And I'm going to break this down for you little by little. Those of you that have taken even a little bit of mathematics know, there's the if part and the then part in logic. If and then statements. P then Q. If P then Q. You remember those things? You slept through those classes a lot, I remember. You know, you could tell. But there was, there was an if and then portion in a statement. Well, this is an if and then statement. And the if part of this statement is la in shakartum. And I, I, when I'm getting into the linguistics, even if you were to be grateful and show one instance of gratitude, يعني الماضي استعمل الماضي بدلا من المضارع لم يقل لا إن تشكروا لا لا إن شكرتم if you were to be grateful even once. Even if you were to show the most minuscule amount of gratitude. And lam let tab'eed, la let tawqeed. When, when conditional statements, the lam has the opposite effect. Even if, it's a like highly unlikely that you showed even the least bit of gratitude to Allah. To show gratitude, what did I say? What condition did I set? Musa alayhi salam already taught us the condition. Remember what? What did I say? Remember what? Remember the favor of Allah. If you can remember the favor of Allah, the next step will be, you will be... Grateful. If you can't remember the favor of Allah, you can't be grateful. And remembering means you've got to think about it. And if you're thinking about negative things, then this process never begins. This entire process never starts. So it has to start your thinking about Allah's favor. Then it pushes you to be what? Grateful. And Allah says, even if you could show me one instant, one instance of gratitude, what would I do? لا أزيدنكم Now let me translate it to you, even though the translation does nothing. To, to what the Arabic is capturing with Allah's word. I swear to it, Allah says. Lam. This is Lam li jawab al qasam. I swear to it. I will absolutely, 
absolutely, guaranteed, absolutely increase you. Allah doesn't just say it once. لا. See the, 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 the word here, the mudara, the present tense form refu- uh, refers to continuity. I will increase you and increase you and increase you over and over and over and over again. It won't stop. I will keep on increasing you. That's the present tense form. Gratitude was mentioned in the past tense, suggesting it's just show me one instance of gratitude. Just show me one instance of gratitude. And then immediately he switches when my turn. This is the if part. You just do one. Allah's part, he does it over and over and over again. And on top of that, there's three other things you have to notice. Or several things. I, mean, I, don't, I, I don't really want to put a number. Because I don't have a number in my head. But a few things you have to notice about La Azidannakum. One, he swore to it. When does Allah swear? Allah swears subhanahu wa ta'ala when he knows the people he's speaking to will not believe him. They don't take it seriously. And he swears to something when it's highly, highly, highly important. He swears in the ayah. La, the lam is for qasam. Then on top of that, usually Allah uses huwa. He. Allah speaks about, about himself and he speaks. He, like the beginning of the surah, bi izni rabbi him. By the permission of their master. The third person is used. Then Allah Azza wa Jal to dis- describe his closeness to you. Many times in the Quran he uses nahnu, we. That's the norm in the Qur'an. If you go from the distance, he is far away. We is closer. To describe his closeness to you, he uses which one? We. But in the most special circumstances in the Qur'an, Allah gets even closer and uses ana, I. I is used in the most special circumstances. It's not the norm in the Qur'an. I know some of you have a question, how come Allah uses we in the Qur'an anyway? That's a separate and very interesting discussion. But at least one thing I want to share with you, whenever you see, even in the English translation, you see the word I being used for Allah, or me being used for Allah Azza wa Jal, know that that's not a typical place in the Qur'an. That's a special, special place in the Qur'an. Either that happens when Allah is extremely merciful, or it happens when Allah is extremely angry. Otherwise it doesn't happen. It happens in one of those two very extreme cases. Now in this case, Allah uses I, the closest pronoun possible. The closest pronoun possible in, in, in Allah's kalam. And He says, and so He comes the closest to us and swears that He will increase and increase and increase and increase. And by the way, the other mercy of Allah, as some ulama have commented, khatabana fil ayah. He addressed us in the ayah. He doesn't say, La in shakaru, la azidannahum. He says, La in shakartum, I'm talking to you. Allah is talking to you directly. He didn't say, If they are grateful, I will increase them. He said, If you're grateful, you know the mercy of Allah in this ayah, He's talking to you. You and I talk to Allah, we make dua. In this ayah, Allah is talking to us. Allah is talking to us. Think, be grateful. If you could just be grateful once, I will increase you over and over and over and over again. I swear to it, I swear to it. La azidanna mubari'afta. Those of you that are suffering through sarf know something about that. Noon za'idah, then two noon za'idah, then you start crying and you know, you know the, the, the sarf charts, right? So this, this is the heaviest form of the present tense used in the Arabic language. La azidannakum. But then, just the, this formula, it even increases, it goes further. You see, in the Arabic language, you can't just say, I will increase you. This is called, this, this fi'l has ibham in it, it's, it's ambiguous. You have to qualify it. Let me give you an example, I'll bet you all of you know. There's a famous dua, Rabbi zidni ilman. Rabbi zidni ilman. So when you say increase, you don't just say, Master, increase me. Increase mean what? And then you add what word? I mean, it's called tamiz. This is a distinction. You, d- you distinguish this, this verb because it's ambiguous in and of itself. Increase me. I mean, we don't say increase me in weight, increase me in depression. You don't, you don't do that, you know. You say increase me in knowledge. Increase me in guidance. Was it hum hudan? You know, zadat hum iman. And there's always a distinguisher, a qualifier. Increase them in something. But the mercy of Allah in this ayah, in this ayah, Allah says, you be grateful, I swear to it, I will continuously increase you. The question immediately arises, ask for the principles of the Arabic language, increase you in what? Allah doesn't answer that question. And this is what they say in Arabic, Rubba sukut and ablahu min kalam. They say, perhaps silence says a lot more than speech would say. Allah didn't want to limit it. Allah did not want to limit it. 
I will increase you in finances, in guidance, in health, in life, in happiness, in harmony, in peace, in knowledge, in understanding, in ability. Man! Allah will give you everything. If you could just be what? Grateful. And how will you be grateful? You think about Allah's favors. Allah is offering you and me in this ayah a way to turn our entire life around. You know, we say, they have these, in, in America it's a big thing, these self-help seminars. These guys that become millionaires have these seminars. Let me come to my program and I'll show you how to be a millionaire. And you, you won't, your life savings is $2,000 and you're going to pay that to him so he can teach you how to be a millionaire and he's going to, when you go there, say, yeah, you got to wake up in the morning and make sure you brush your teeth. <laughs> Thanks for that advice. When are we going to get to the millionaire part? <laughs> you know, <laughs> How, how are you going to come out of your... And people, desperate people, go to these things. And they get scammed into these things. These guys, all these like self-made, how to be a success guys that sell their books, their success is that they sold those books. They didn't really do anything else in their life. You know? But in this particular ayah, what is Allah offering us? It's not just, you know, in, in the, in the non-Muslim world, they say attitudes have an impact on reality. We know that attitudes are attitude to be grateful to Allah, to remember the favors of Allah, the, the ghayb from Allah, Allah will change our situation. And He will increase opportunities for us. And He will increase all the goodness in our life for us if we just have the right attitude. And attitude is not a matter of what's on my tongue. It's not a matter of what I write, or what I type, or what I blog. It's an attitude of what's inside here. And that won't happen until dhikr happens. Remembering the favor of Allah. Constantly remembering the favor of Allah. Next time young people here, next time you look at your parents, remember the favor of Allah. Remember the favor of Allah. And it's incredible. It's incredible. That Allah Azza wa did not make a direct correlation. You know what the direct correlation would have been? The direct correlation would have been, if you remember this favor, if you remember the favor of parents, Allah will increase the life of your parents. Allah didn't do that. You remember the favor of your parents, Allah will increase you in everything. You remember the favor of, you know, Allah has gifted you with a car. You have a car that you are, you know, bought with halal money. That every time you sit in the car, you be grateful to Allah, ya Allah, have a car. He will increase you in everything. Not just one thing. He won't just increase the transmission life of your car. Not just that. He'll increase you because He didn't limit it. He didn't limit it. And the other, the, the last, this is by the way the first half of the I got another half to go. Okay, so, but I'm almost done with the first half. In this first half of the ayah, one last thing. Allah says, wa, wa in shakartum, wa lam yaqul wa in shakartum lillahi. And if you Surah Luqman, when Surah Luqman we read, wa, you know, uh, anishkur lillah, be grateful to Allah, in Surah Luqman we read. Here we read, Allah says to us, if you could just be grateful, He didn't even say be grateful to me. And, if, and uh, you know, la in shakartum li. If you were grateful to me, I would increase you. No, no, no. He just said be grateful because being grateful is not limited to Allah Azza wa Jal. You have to be grateful to your teachers. You have to be grateful to your parents. You have to be grateful to your, you know, to your friends. You know, you have to be grateful for people that good company. You have to be grateful for them. You have to be even grateful to non-Muslims who help you. Being grateful to others is not a matter of shirk. Allah commands us in the Qur'an to be grateful to our parents. And, should, you know, and, and actually, even in the case of Musa and Fir'aun. You know, Fir'aun came to Musa alayhi salam with very insulting language. Didn't we, you know, Alam Rabbika Fina Walida? Didn't we raise you here as a child? You come, you're going to come and talk to me this way? So Musa alayhi salam's response was actually one of acknowledging the favor. وَتِلْكَ نِعْمَةٌ تَمُنُّهَا عَلَيَّ that's the favor you did to me. Acknowledgement of the favor, I don't use these. I just, I'd rather just be a ball of sweat. I'm, I'm fine. Okay. It makes me look more serious, you know. So, <laughs> anyhow. <laughs> so, it, it, it's, it's halal to laugh in a masjid, right? Is that, is that okay? Okay. All right. It's okay. All right. Just check it. All right. So, what was I talking about? Something about Islam. Where were we? Something about Musa is very good. You're in the right neighborhood. Very good. Ah, when Musa alayhi salam was even acknowledging the favor of Fir'aun. He was even acknowledging the favor of Fir'aun. 
In other words, we have to be appreciative people, not just to Allah. Don't be like that weird guy. Every time somebody does you, does you a favor, like gives you a car ride, he goes, Bro, I would thank you, but this is really from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So alhamdulillah, it's not really you. Don't be that guy, please. <laughs> <laughs> you know, any good that comes, it comes from Allah. Yes, it does, but you have to thank the people, bro. You have to appreciate the people around you. And I especially give that advice to the husbands in the audience. Especially, you know, brothers are going to come to you, brother, why didn't you talk to the wife? Yeah, I'm talking to them too, but I'm talking to us first. Because we've got a problem. We, we, we don't acknowledge, we don't appreciate. We don't do that. We don't actually say words of encouragement. They, especially if you're Pakistani like I am, it hurts us in the ribs if we compliment our wives. There's actually a genetic problem we have. We're not able to say good things to our wives. I don't know if you have that in other countries, but we have it. Right? But get over your pain and say something nice to your wife. Compliment your wife. You know, say something nice to your children. Don't just say mean things to your kids all the time. No, stop complaining about them. Mother-in-laws that are listening to this, mother-in-laws specifically, stop complaining about your daughter-in-law. Stop. Say something nice about her once in a while. I know it's going to be hard. It'll take you a few weeks to search one thing that you can find that's nice about her. But you will eventually find that treasure and just mention it. Just say. And if you have something bad to say, don't say it. It won't make you any happier. It won't make your son any happier. Nobody will be happy. You're just increasing your own misery and the misery of others around you by complaining all the time. We are not a people of complaint, we're a people of gratitude. We're a people of Alhamdulillah. That's what we are. Now let's talk about this last half of the ayah. وَلَا إِن كَفَرْتُمْ If you're grateful, I will increase you undoubtedly and continuously and I swear to it multiple times. But if you were to be ungrateful... Is everything okay? Okay. If you were to be ungrateful, وَلَا إِن كَفَرْتُمْ Now, if you were to be ungrateful, did he qualify? كَفَرْتُمْ بِاللَّهِ بِرُسُدِهِ بِنِعَمِهِ He didn't mention. If you're ungrateful in any way, if you're in denial of any favor, then what happens? Now, remember I told you, I, I, I made it sound like a math class in the beginning. There's an if statement and a then. Remember that? You know what's incredible about this ayah? When Allah talked about the gratitude, He made an if and a then. I explained that to you. When He talked about the ingratitude, He only gave the if. He did not give the then. He did not say a then. He said, وَلَا إِن كَفَرْتُمْ إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ وَلَمْ يَقُلْ فَا إِنَّ عَذَابِي لَشَدِيدٌ If there was a fa in the Arabic language there, then it would have meant, if you are ungrateful, then my punishment is extremely intense. But Allah did not do that. Allah didn't say, if you're ungrateful, then my punishment is extremely intense. Because if Allah said that, then every time you and I show ingratitude, guaranteed what is coming. Intense punishment. That little sa over there would have been jawab al And Allah did not give us that. And if you cannot be grateful for anything else, be grateful to Allah, there's no fa there. Be grateful to Allah, there's no then. It's like a dot, dot, dot. If you're ungrateful, dot, dot, dot. All I'll say is my punishment is extremely intense. But I won't make a correlation between the two things. When, you, when you're grateful to Allah, He makes a correlation. When you're ungrateful to Allah, He does not make a correlation. Then that's the mercy of my Rabb. That's His mercy, He doesn't do that. SubhanAllah. Allah says, one of my favorite ayat in the Qur'an, Allahi. Especially people that are like, you know, they do a lot of sins. And they're like, oh Allah is just gonna, I'm just, I'm so going to hell. I mean, every other khutbah, I get a guarantee again that I'm totally going to hell. You know? That guy, just listen to these brief words of Allah. He says, My Allah bi adabikum. What will Allah do? What will Allah get out of punishing you? What do you think? What's He gonna do punishing you? Why do you think He wants to punish you? Why do you have that opinion of Allah? Why do you have that opinion? Inna adabi la shadeed. My punishment is intense. My punishment is intense, not related to if you're ungrateful. Just, inna labiba mila lisharati yafhamu. The intelligent one can get the idea. Just know that the ungrateful ones, if you head down this path, then punishment is coming. But I'm not guaranteeing you. This is the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jalla. Now, as I close this ayah, what I really want to talk to you about is how do we become a people of hope and mercy and not lose hope in the mercy of Allah Azza wa Jal. As individuals, and then finally I'll talk to you about the Ummah and I'll, I'm, I'm done inshaAllah ta'ala. At the level of an individual, 
the, in, the key ingredient is constant and conscious. Conscious, alhamdulillah. Conscious praise of Allah. And by the way, when somebody complains, you and I, were, we become people of complaint. At least in America, I know, we're people of complaint. You know, we're just, we love complaining about things. We like to rate everything. You can't buy anything without seeing the ratings and the complaints underneath of every product, every book, every, everything. There's always a complaint, right? When you get programmed into complaining all the time, you know what that means? That in your mind, you are deserving. And you didn't get what you deserved. That's what it means. If you are in a position to complain, that means you got less than what you deserved. But you know, the people of Islam, us, the people of La ilaha illallah, we start our relationship from the point where we say we deserve nothing. And Allah deserves everything. And whatever we get is a gift from Allah. We are from the very beginning in no position to what? We're in no position to complain. Our entire religious foundation begins with the phrase that is most recited as a religious mandate in every single salah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. If you believe in the phrase Alhamdulillah, and every one of you knows it by heart, it is impossible for you to be pessimistic. Because no matter what happens, what is a constant for you? Alhamdulillah. Praise and gratitude belong to Allah. And to praise and be grateful to Allah, you have to think positive. Otherwise you'd be complaining to Allah. Because we're a people of Alhamdulillah, we can't complain. That's the attitude you have to develop in yourself. And you have to instill into others. If people around you are complaining, change the subject. Don't complain about them complaining. <laughs> change the subject. Talk about something else. If your mother's constantly complaining, go massage her feet. If she's saying you're such a disappointment, say, Mom, just give me a good one right here. Just give me just a good one. And she'll start laughing and say, No, Trump. <laughs> And she'll be in a better mood after that. You know? But don't allow for conversation, negative conversations to foster. Don't do that. Don't complain about the masjid. Don't complain about other Muslims. Don't complain about groups you don't like. Or, you know, uh, people, speakers you don't like. Or, you know, factions you don't like. Or, you don't, don't talk about these things. You've got too many good things to talk about. There's too much negative energy. It's not, it doesn't produce any good. Do something good with your time. Do something productive with your time. Now finally, just a comment about the Ummah. I'm sharing with you my personal conviction. This, you don't have to share this conviction, this is my personal conviction. I believe we are at the crossroads of one of the greatest opportunities in the history of this Ummah. The Ummah is now in a position, because of the advent of mass media, because of the advent of social media, because of the advent of YouTube, because of the advent of modern technology and mass communication, because of our numbers in the West, not just to mention in the Muslim world, all over the West, we are in a position today that we were never in before to show what Islam really is. We are in that position. We can show the world what the Qur'an really is. Who the Prophet really was sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have that opportunity. And there is only, as far as I'm concerned, reasons to be optimistic. There's only reasons to be optimistic. We have talked about, we have, we have had our elders and ourselves sit around the hookah lounge or the coffee table or over baklava or chai pani or biscuit shiskit and talk about the political problems and the, you know, this, this problem in Egypt and that problem in Syria and this problem in Palestine and that problem in Pakistan and this problem of the youth and that problem over here. Enough! We have, we have, I know we have problems, but you know what? We need to talk about our opportunities. We need to talk about how we're going to make positive changes. We have to change the collective thinking of the Ummah and make it positive. And when we start doing that and actually start working towards solutions, then you will see, we will become a people of guided, we should be grateful we're living in this age, in the age of opportunity, where we can serve Allah's deen in ways that we could never have served before. We should be grateful for that, not complain, Ya Allah, if only I lived in the time of the Sahaba, it would have been so much better. No bro, you would have been still the same lazy bum you are now, <laughs> except in the time of the Sahaba. <laughs> okay? You are who you are. <laughs> and Allah created you for this age. Allah made you part of this age because He sees something in you that will bring service to His deen. That every man and every woman, we have to, we have to think positive now about how we're going to take Allah's deen forward. In the place we live, in our own family, around ourselves. What are, what are the talents that Allah has given you that you're going to contribute to Islam? There are so many young people sitting in the audience today. 
It's incredible. I mean, just look around you and, and think. When some, so many of you come from back home countries, and in those back home countries, how many young people are in the masjid? How many young people are sitting listening to a lecture? I mean, can you think about that? Isn't this a reason to be grateful to Allah? To be optimistic? SubhanAllah, and so many of you from so many different backgrounds, you don't even know each other. You don't even know each other. But you're, you're trying to learn something about deen or be inspired about deen. This, this is enough to be motivated. This is enough for us to do incredible things for Allah Azza wa Jal. This is why I'm, I'm extremely optimistic. Wherever I go, I'm just optimistic about what we as Muslims are going to be able to accomplish. And I, the last bit I want to share with you guys is the, the youth in particular that are sitting in the audience, the young men and the young women that are sitting in the audience. You know, our elders have made their contributions. They have built these masajids. You can complain about, oh, they don't understand, or they have a halaqa in their local language and I don't get it. Complain all you want. But actually, they've done more. If they didn't build these masajids, we wouldn't be having this gathering. We wouldn't be having it. You know? The reason that we have the, the places we have is because of our elders. We have to be grateful to our elders. Not compl stop complaining about the elders. Be so respect to them. And the elders, stop complaining about the youth. Be grateful to Allah that somebody else is saying, La ilaha illallah, You're, you know, you and I are headed older, no, I'm getting older too, we're headed towards our graves. And there's somebody else after us that's going to say, La ilaha illallah. Start handing these young, young blood some responsibility around the masjid. Give them some more work. Give them some more tasks. And you guys, the, the young blood here, I tell you specifically you guys, you have to think so creatively now. And you have to think so, like, so thoroughly about how you are going to serve this deen. I've seen some of the most incredible creative projects, Islamic projects, come from you. It makes me so incredibly proud that they're doing such wonderful things and it's just the beginning. If you guys put your mind to it, wallahi, the eyes of the ummah are on the Muslim youth that live in the West. You don't even know. The, uh, the eyes of the entire ummah, what are the Muslims in the West going to do? They have the best educations, they have the best opportunities. They have the better economic situation. They're, living in they're not living in political turmoil. If all those ni'mah, ni'am from Allah are there for them, what are they going to do with them? They're going to make the ummah a better, better place. You know, the entire ummah is going to be lifted through them. The expectations are on you. And they're not just from the, the rest of the ummah. They're from Allah Azza wa Jal too. If He gives you more, He wants more from you. If He gives you more, then He wants more from you. There's so many young people like you and me that are much smarter than you and me, that have never had the opportunity to go to school, that have never had the opportunity to learn. They, they're living in dire economic situations, political situations. And Allah pulled us out of those situations not because we deserve them, but because He expects something from us. So be grateful for the honor Allah has given you to serve. Put your mind to it. Learn this deen. Learn how to serve this, and don't just learn it for learning. Learn this deen to serve, to make the ummah a better place, to make the world a better place. You guys in the, in, uh, you know, uh, in the UK, I mean, there's such a huge population, mashallah, of Muslims. What you guys can accomplish, my, my, I, my head starts spinning, what Muslims can accomplish here. Really, the numbers you have here, the concentration you have here, it's incredible. The connection to the Muslim world you have here, we're connected, we're disconnected in the United States by a huge ocean. You guys are literally right next to the Muslim world. So the interaction you have with ulama and the Muslim tradition is far more strong. It's far stronger. What you're able to accomplish here, only the, my imagination just goes wild. And yours should too. May Allah Azza wa Jal make us a positive people. And may Allah Azza wa Jal make us a people that are full of hope and aspiration and positivity. May Allah Azza wa Jal make, put every one of us that says La ilaha illallah, that says Muhammadur Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, put every one of us to use for the service of his deen. And may Allah accept whatever, you know, whatever, you know, faulty services we provide to his deen. May Allah overlook all of the flaws and accept whatever we have done and maintain our sincerity for, for his sake alone. Barak الله لي ولكم في القرآن الحكيم ونفعني وإياكم بالآيات وذكر الحكيم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته